Hamilton County. Sometimes this takes a minute, so we start yeah. a minute early. <laughs> The time is 6.30. We'll now call this meeting to order. All right. First thing will be the invocation. Mr. Hodges, would you like to lead us in prayer? Uh, folks, I just want to add one small thing to that. Um, you know, some of us are, are veterans, and as a parent who has a son serving in the military, uh, we received that call that frightens, frightens the mom um, from my son yesterday about, hey, Dad, we're okay, but you're going to see something on the news today pray for those families. My son is currently deployed over there with an air crew and uh, another air crew, which you've seen on the news probably since yesterday, the uh, American Air Force jet that went down in Taliban territory. Um, that air crew and my son's air crew were friends that uh, did an air show in Georgia to go before they were deployed. Um, so please pray for our men and women that are overseas because it does get crazy and, and it was sad to to have that phone call or that text from my son that hey we're okay but we lost friends today so please pray for our military overseas um well if you will please join me in the pledge of allegiance i pledge allegiance to the flag of the united states of america and to the republic which stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag, I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. 
All right. As as we say in every meeting, or as I say in every meeting, the rules of decorum are in effect. The only thing I ask everybody to do is please be respectful. You know, when you when you do have the opportunity to come up for citizens' comments or the public hearing, let's just be respectful. Um, <clears throat> next up is citizens' comments. Before we start the citizens' comments, if you're here for the public hearing side of it, um, over the 6.4 uh, action item, if you could hold them till then, it would be great. Um, so at this point, we will go to citizens' comments. I know Mr. Donegan had something on there. So Mr. Donegan, you will be first. You might be the only one in citizens' comments, but you will be first. Um, is the code enforcement issue, and is that I understand it, the, the council is considering what we can do in the options of code enforcement that Chief Simmons has been trained and, and is currently being considered to be utilized as a code enforcement, and there may be a concern in terms of the amount of time that he can spend on code enforcement. I just implore the council for the – I have personally – gone to the city council, members on the council, three times about code uh, violations in my neighborhood uh, over two administrations, okay? And it always has been, well, we got to get a code enforcement officer in place. Well, if we have a code enforcement officer, even if he's restricted on the amount of time he can do, I say turn him loose. Position to fund the project. We're talking about the sewer project. The availability of a wastewater line on 205, specifically at the intersection of 205 and 550, have potential to spur commercial development, forward generating additional ad valorem property sales tax and tax revenue to the city. Until we know what we want for commercial and retail development, it's way, way premature to try to, to establish it. We're going to get a sewer. The sewer is going to be implemented for the benefit of the city and doing what Lisa has prescribed in here. But until we know what we would like to have as commercial and retail, what's the most desirous to the city and to the vision of the city is premature to, to, to select. So what I'm employing to the planning is only into the council is to determine, visit with the property owners that own that property now that are willing to do a plan development, invest our time and effort and resources but don't say yes till we know what, when, and how. Okay, the sewer will come. 
and we can ensure the sewer will come. So in, in, instead of trying to, as the, the staff report said, the city's in a good financial position to fund the product, well, I don't think we need to deviate and in, 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 in make it financially more attractive for the property owners or the investors to do their deal. Let's see what they want to do, how they're going to do it, why they're going to do it, and then we can determine a yes or no. Thank you very much. Someone else in the in the social media world might want it, right? Um, Carl Crawley, uh, 2201 Main Street. Um, the request uh, before you on this item is a final plat for um, basically it's two lots. It was a 39 acre tract that divided up into about five acres and 30 whatever 34 the remainder. Uh, the idea is the five acres, which has frontage on pulling, both of that frontage on pulling, well, a new house will be built at that location. There's an existing house on the remainder, 34-acre lot, and that will remain in place. Um, staff's recommending approval, and P&Z recommended approval 5 to 0. Yes, Mayor. The city was approached by Bloomfield Homes offering a Chapter 380 agreement. Chapter 380 agreements are economic development agreements designed to promote economic development and to stimulate business and commercial activity pursuant to Chapter 380 of the Local Government Code. Home builders like Bloomfield must purchase building materials from various suppliers uh, for the projects. And obviously, Ms. Clinton Chisholm, we don't have building suppliers in our town. Um, Typically, the point of sale of these materials is where the sales tax money is generated, benefiting the city where the items are purchased, rather than the city where the items are being used or stored. This agreement allows Bloomfield Homes and the city to partner, allowing Bloomfield to opt out of paying sales tax to suppliers on building materials, but instead purchase items using a Texas Direct <coughs> permit, uh, Payment Permit that generates local, local use tax revenue for our city, rather than having those funds go to our neighboring cities. Um, where they would normally be purchased. Uh, there is a spreadsheet. Um, well, let me give you an example. For, in this particular case, Bloomfield is under contract to purchase 50 lots with an eventual plans uh, to purchase 200 lots in the city limits over a period of time. There's a spreadsheet in your packet that breaks down potential benefit to the city as well as potential uh, benefit to Bloomfield. The use tax generated is collected by the comptroller's office and deposited into the city's account. Twice a year, the city would split funds collected with 40% going to Bloomfield, 60 to the city. Over a period of 10 years, the estimated benefit to the city is between 150 
thousand dollars at today's home prices uh, for the average home price, with potential to be as much as one hundred and seventy-one thousand dollars, considering inflation over time. The Chapter Three Eighty Agreement allows both Bloomfield and the city to benefit. Without the agreement, neither Bloomfield nor the city would see those funds. They would stay in the, the town wherever that point of sale might have been. Uh, the city has a similar agreement in place with Highland Homes that we did maybe a year and a half ago. Um, and today we've gained about $25,000 in revenue. Uh, Mr. Doug Duffy is here. He's a CPA and he kind of specializes in these economic development agreements. And he's here to kind of present um, this on behalf of Bloomfield. And he can answer any questions or maybe give you some more detail if you'd like. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, I've, I've had the privilege of coming before this council and the prior council for two separate agreements, one for Highland, and it's been in place for almost two years now. But I think it, it's a really good example of how a home builder can work with a city and generate new money for a city where they're building new homes and where their customers are going to live as opposed to benefiting the location where their suppliers are located. Uh, I thought Lisa did a great job of explaining that that tax is typically going to go to Dallas or Fort Worth or wherever the suppliers are located, not to the city of McClendon Chisholm. And the only way that happens is if they get a direct payment permit and actually convert a sales tax to a use tax, and all use taxes are destination-based. So this allows them, um, I think, a, a great opportunity to, to prove, and it's a very performance-driven agreement where if they don't generate new money for the city, and they don't give you a copy of their confidential tax returns showing exactly how much they benefited the city of McClendon Chisholm, you owe them nothing. So it's, it's pretty risk-free on the city's behalf, and I consider it something where it's, it's new money. Uh, it's about estimated about $571 per house. You multiply that you know, by 200 houses, and that's based on today's cost. As the price of the materials goes up, so does the local tax revenue. So. Um, I think it's a, a great opportunity for the city to work with a home builder and generate new money that they wouldn't have otherwise. So if you have any questions, I'm free to answer them. Just a couple of questions, sir. Um, what is the Bloomfield agreement as far as the percentage? So, I'm oh, sorry, the existing agreement. Which one's the existing agreement? With Highland Homes. Highland. So is there a 60-40 as well? It is. Okay, so it's the same, basically the same terms? It is. Okay. And Lisa, that didn't bring on any additional accounting costs on the city side or anything like that? Is that correct? Very minimal. Uh, they actually provide us a breakdown of what's been collected by the comptroller, and then our accountant verifies that. Okay. So it, I talked to him, and it really takes probably 30 minutes or so to do it each time we make a submission. So it's minimal. <coughs> And Nathan, just so you'll know, I mean, Bloomfield has to file, by law, has to file monthly tax returns, but they've agreed to do semi-annual grants so that it's that much less administrative time on the city's behalf, so that even though they're going to file 12 tax returns, they're only going to send you two grant requests a year. Thank you, sir. And they're required to do that just, by the way, to get anything back. So in essence, the city makes money anytime they make money is really what it is. And for the most part, you don't go into business to lose money or not make money. So the uh, incentive they have to run their business and be successful benefits the city uh, from that standpoint until they do like you pointed out, until they you know file certain things and let us know until they file something like the tax certificate, use tax certificates, you're not going to know how much they're entitled to. So there are going to be ways to keep track of things and know what's going on. And, and like you put in, the, the safeguards there, that's how they get their money back from them is when they file the use tax certificates, your tax returns, et cetera, et cetera, and there's a track record. Um, so that's the, the risk-free element that he mentioned earlier. One question for Lisa. From what I understand, it's a 10-year agreement, but both parties can terminate the agreement. I believe that's correct. Is that correct, Mr. Duffy? Yeah, there's there's notices provided for both parties, but I think the only reason that Bloomfield asked for a 10-year agreement is that they want to go through this process and take over the responsibilities. They'd like to do it for any new developments that they have, including, you know, beyond the 50 lots they currently have, to go ahead and expand that and do it 
more frequently, but use a consistent process. And I mean, you know, the only reason the city would potentially not want to do it is if you got a big lumber company that was going to generate that tax already, and you just don't have that yet. Sure. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, and uh, good evening, uh, Council and, and staff. Uh, my uh, request to be here this evening was to uh, inform the Council uh, of a complete rewrite that Rockwall County is going through with its subdivision regulations. Municipalities have ordinances uh, that govern your development of subdivisions. Counties have regulations and they are quite different and uh, much more stringent if you work with a city's uh, ordinance than if you are looking at what a county can enforce uh, and do that. Uh, the um, interlocal agreement that we have with gives you a copy of our uh, regulations and uh, so uh, you have accepted the responsibility of any developments that are uh, petitioned for within your ETJ areas that you would take the lead in seeing that you research both your ordinances and our regulations and then whichever our agreement is, whichever is the more stringent of the two is what you would enforce. Recently, uh, in fact, it's almost been uh, a year ago, I guess, there was a development that was um, presented to the county on Poetry Road. And that Poetry Road was uh, about an 80-acre track. Uh, it was originally presented uh, with like 200 homes that were going to be uh, built on that track of land. Uh, during our review of the uh, subdivision and the development as it was laid out to us, uh, it was brought to our attention that uh, we had uh, in our regulations that you had 50-foot setbacks. And we were under the impression that that was uh, per the government code, we could do that. The developer uh, filed a lawsuit against the county based on our setbacks and uh, so in review of what we had the uh, general code says that if it's a um, major thoroughfare road you can enforce 50 foot but if it's a neighborhood type street 30 feet was the number that you had. Well the lawsuit had been filed and so we worked with the developer and, and got an agreement that the developer would uh, rescind uh, or pull down his lawsuit if we would give a, um, a preliminary approval to that particular project. Now, preliminary projects are somewhat uh, more in line with do you have all the documents that you are presenting to uh, staff uh, and and that's about all that covers then it's followed with engineering studies uh, that go about and that's when you really kind of get into the meat of the width of the streets and utilities and so forth that was in there so we had that particular uh, incident happen with us and so as a result of that the county then said you know it's been probably well over 10 years since we had gone back and really taken a hard look at the uh, regulations and we wanted to do that. 
not long ago, a previous council uh, here in McClendon had uh, worked out an agreement with the city of Rockwall to take over some of the ETJ areas uh, that were under your responsibility. So I want to tell you that, that um, I think some of you are already aware of this, that um, D.R. Horton uh, picked up a contract that uh, had been through your city uh, several years ago and was approved by TCEQ, uh, which was over, uh, I forget the name of the, help me Mike, if you remember the name, of an Arizona, um, pardon? UEG, yes, correct, thank you, um, that had all the approval from TCEQ to develop uh, about 1,200 acres that were in that particular area. That land swap of ETJs then went over to City of Rockwall. D.R. Horton came to me and asked uh, me to take a look at the development plans that they had. Uh, their initial proposal uh, was about 3,000 homes on that 1,200 acres that they wanted to um, uh, ask us for approval for. So I, I quickly told them, hey, uh, we, don't, we have an interlocal agreement with the city of Rockwall, so you must go to Rockwall and work with them. Um, they commented at the time that they had been to Rockwall and that uh, they were trying to work out uh, some issues about law enforcement uh, and fire that they would have to have in that particular development. And uh, at the point uh, of time that they were talking to Rockwall, I think Rockwall had said, hey, we don't have much interest in providing those services uh, to you. So they come back uh, to me and I say, no, 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 sorry. You need to go back to Rockwall and work with them uh, on your approval. When they go back to Rockwall, uh, Rockwall then begins to, uh, they, they knew that we were in this rewrite, and uh, Friesen Nichols is the engineering firm that we have contracted with to, to rewrite our subdivision rules. And um, they, uh, the city of Rockwall says, hey, uh, because the county is revising its regulations and we have an interlocal agreement with them, the city of Rockwall instituted a moratorium on subdivisions that would take place in their ETJ area. Counties do not have that ability. Cities do. Counties do not. Sir, is it, is it home rule and general rule cities that have that ability? Pardon? Home rule and general rule cities have that ability? You would need to ask your council uh, that question. Uh, I, I'm not sure of that answer. Uh, but I, but I, do, I do know that there is a distinction about what municipalities can do and what counties uh, can, can do as far as a moratorium goes. Friesen Nichols has advised us, uh, we, we met uh, a little over a week ago, and to give us a uh, status of where, where they were in our rewrite, we, we first did uh, a diagnostic review of our regulations, and they went completely through and pointed out a lot of things. They interviewed each of us individually and said, what would you like to, to change uh, in, in your particular document? Uh, we're, we're looking at a lot of different things that uh, may uh, include uh, some um, storm drains, curbs, a, a lot of other things that uh, the county uh, may want to enforce in their regulation or in our new regulations coming up. Um, so that moratorium has been placed and that project uh, there, there's been some communication back and forth between uh, D.R. Horton and Rockwall in that uh, typically I think in the past you, they've been able to go ahead and give them engineering reports and say would you go ahead and, and look at our engineering reports and give us approval on those because that typically takes a couple of months and we'd like to go ahead and get that approval during this moratorium. 
so that once it is lifted, then we can immediately, you know, go into um, a, a build type project. The city of Rockwall has refused to do that by saying we don't know what's going to happen with the county's regs regulations when when they come back. And so uh, we're looking at the May or June time frame uh, when we anticipate those to be uh, complete. Uh, I believe that there is a, or we may even be having like a public hearing uh, so that uh, we can get that information out. Um, and then we would certainly immediately upon uh, revision and approval of those documents, those regulations, subdivision regulations, then uh, each of us will be going to our uh, associated communities uh, and presenting that to you, uh, having your staff review those, and then uh, we would need to initiate a new interlocal agreement. I'll tell you the story about Rockwall because I just want you to know what is going on. That's kind of a I don't know whether that's a front door, back door, or side door over there where, where the area is. You know, it's off 548 um, and just, I think, past the Tate Farms uh, over there. Uh, there are a lot of concerns that we have, uh, which it, it's, it's not about us. It's about City of Rockwall overseeing that. But uh, transportation and infrastructure there uh, is, a, is a key issue. Uh, we've got a... Uh, we were able to recently, not long ago, do uh, some upgrades to Edwards Road, which is in that particular area, but it only comes to league from 550 back around to there, so it kind of goes back into a dirt road from there back on over to, to 548. So a lot of things that, uh, that we need to do in, in uh, that particular area. Um, as a side note, I'd like to just, if I may, kind of give you a little bit of uh, my opinion. Uh, this is not county, but PIDs and MUDs come about in within municipalities or within unincorporated areas or ETJs as a result of the community not being able to provide water. That is the thing that I would encourage the city to take a look at is to uh, position yourself to be able to get into the water business. And I think that would give you a lot more uh, leverage, certainly within your community. And if for some reason there are, there are certainly other areas of ETJ that you have, that you would be able to... Um, I think more effectively work with subdivisions that are in those particular areas. In the unincorporated, we don't do water. We don't have access to it. We can't do that. So we're subject to those particular areas coming. And with the recent changes in legislation uh, in this last 86 session uh, that kind of ties your hands as far as being able to annex property uh, out there, um, you know, individuals that are out there must, as I understand it, petition you to come out in, and to take them in. So, um, you know, there's, a, I think, a, a renewed look, and, and we're beginning to see in a lot of the unincorporated areas um, a lot of development that's beginning to start up. And uh, we know that's, that that has been coming. Um, this particular 1,200 acres is contiguous uh, with Mr. Hinckley, who's been, I think, before you in several uh, times before, has about 2,000 acres there. Um, I, I spoke with him the other day. Um, I think that there's, there could be an opportunity that the two, the two of them, the R. Horton and Mr. Hinckley, uh, may work out some kind of deal where a package plant uh, or whatever, uh, you know, usage of the um, septic system might go on Glenn's property over there. They're working together uh, on that. But uh, just want to make you aware of the regulation uh, that, that we're redoing and 
give you notice of things that are going to be happening uh, around uh, your area and give you a heads up uh, on that. So if there's no other, or if there is any question, I'd be glad to try to answer those. The, the moratorium that I spoke of is specific to an ETJ area. I don't know if I said that or not. You can't put a moratorium uh, within your corporate city limits. You can only do it in that particular area. Uh, so City of Rock Falls moratorium, does it go through June until the county figures out what's the time, what's the time on they, they, they are waiting on us to complete our study. Um, there, there could be some timelines that they that that they're going to have to move uh, on that, but they know that we're looking May or June to to wrap it up and be able to come back to you and and uh, ask you to uh, redo that interlocal agreement with us. On it. If that's if if that's all that uh, one one other thing, Mayor, real quickly, and and I'm. I'm uh, I think this is an all related items that goes along with this and that that is a open space and, and we had today uh, a meeting uh, in our commissioners court and uh, we have uh, voted to uh, bring that issue back up and what we would like to do is make that open space area which deals with all these developments around everything to um, add that to the road consortium that we have so we would begin like with the emergency management uh, at what time is that, Mayor? Five? Yeah, five o'clock, and then six o'clock would be the road com uh, uh, consortium, and then we want to put an open space consortium right after that at seven o'clock. So I'll be getting back to you asking you to uh, announce who you would like to have on your, your council attend those meetings. So thank you, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to visit with you. Typically, generally, normally, what moratoriums are used for. Yes, you do. <laughs> yeah, but I, but also when, when you when you do it, it's when development is happening faster than regulations, and it's like, wait a minute, we've got a duty under 51001 that the local government code to do what's best for the health, safety, and welfare of the community. Now, with all due respect to, to the county commissioner, I would request council to let me look at the interlocal. A couple years ago, 242.001A was changed. And so the state law says that a county and a city must, there's no, there's no choice, there's no option. City and a county must get together and come to an agreement where either the city is responsible for uh, planning an EPJ, county is responsible for it, or you basically like two warring countries, you divvy up the ETJ and certain people are responsible, or the fourth one, and and I'm not sure about how it was, I, I think how the county commissioner phrased it, with all due respect, might not currently be commiserate with the law. It does not say you get to pick and choose whose regulations, it's you get one set of regulation, one set of planning regulations, development regulations, land use regulations, et cetera, et cetera, for the ETJ. Not that you go, okay, well, which is more appropriate, use the cities or use the counties. So it sounds like maybe when the interlocal was done, probably a while back is what I'm guessing, right? It sounds like it was perfectly valid and legal then, but portions of it probably are not consistent now with state law, and that may be... Yeah, in council, that's what we're going to address. Okay, yeah, good. That's And that was going to be the next thing. I yeah. think that's maybe what he's saying. So, yes. yeah, expect that, I would assume, to come back at a, at a later date. So we'll get the, uh, get the restrictions, and then um, uh, Lisa will work with you on the interlocal agreement. Is that how that works? Yeah, we can, we can have our council work uh, with yours, and, and, uh, and we'll work with yours. So how long does it usually take to get the interlocal well, the body of it, it hasn't 
there's been some things that more or less more likely and I've not seen it but typically generally normally in these situations they need to be updated okay that provision that he referenced in, in my opinion is no longer legally valid because the state like I said 242001 is given we got four choices so we have options, but we're limited to those four options. So it's about what the county commissioners and the city council can agree to in terms of what's going to happen in the, in the ETJ. It sounds like the interlocal will be the easy part. The harder part is waiting on Freeze and Nichols to come back with the results and then the commissioners going through it and coming to some conclusion and then actually coming back to us. So it's like it's just a process. Right. including zoning, platting, and issuance of a building permit. Each has its own set of regulations. What is on the table tonight for consideration is a zoning change request only. Um, zoning is land use and is regulated by Chapter 211 of the Local Government Code and by our city ordinances. Zoning regulations are designed to encourage appropriate land use that is compatible and suitable for an area. Other considerations include any street congestion, securing safety from fire, panic, and other dangers, promoting health, safety, and general welfare, providing adequate light and air, preventing overcrowding of land, avoiding undue concentration of population, facilitating adequate provision of transportation, water, sewer, schools, parks, and other public requirements, and zoning must comply with the comprehensive plan. <clears throat> the procedures, PNZ, here's a zoning change request and is a recommending body for council. PNZ makes a recommendation to council after determining if the proposed land use is suitable for the area and if it complies with the comprehensive plan. Council then weighs that information with information presented at the council meeting and makes a decision. Again, Zoning considerations are about land use. Business success or failure is not our concern. That is the business owner's concern. If a land use is approved, such as retail, we cannot discriminate on which business is allowed if it meets our city's our requirements. We only determine if the use is appropriate or not. Technical or engineering requirements are addressed in the platting process, not the zoning process. Again, tonight we are only hearing a zoning case. Prior to issuance of a building permit, the building official will determine if the building permit application conforms to the appropriate zoning regulations, the plat was approved, and, the, and will, the review, will review a building permit application to determine if building codes and local ordinances are met and perform inspections during each phase of the construction process. Okay, first off, before we go into the public hearing, Carl? Carl Crawley, uh, what you have before you today is a request of a, um, it's, I think we decided we're going to call it the south corner of <laughs> 550 and 205 because we didn't know if it was southeast or southwest, and I think we just said south. It's on the same side of 205 across 550 from the Sonic. Now everyone yes. knows where it is. It's approximately an acre and a half. It's presently zoned GB general business. 
Uh, general business allows retail, commercial, office uses, 35 feet in height, has certain setback requirements. Um, it, it, it is restricted probably more than anything else in the, in, in the zoning ordinance under the commercial development standards, and I'll get into that in a little while. Uh, what the request for is for a plan development district for general business rules, basically, as the, as the underlying uh, set of rules. A plan development district um, sets rules for this piece of property. There'll be no other piece of property in McClendon Chisholm that will have those same rules. Um, in this case, it is before you as a conceptual plan development district. The conceptual plan is in your docket material. Um, that they can either apply as a conceptual plan development district or a develop plan, a detailed development plan. Uh, while, while this is written as a conceptual, they will have to come back at a later date before in the, how it's written in this case before the PNZ and you with a detailed development plan and elevations. Um, the, the regular zoning today, general business, um, if they had a plat that you mentioned and their uses that they complied with and complied with all the rules, they would not have to come back before any other body to get a building permit and can start construction. So that's one additional thing that has been added in this plan development district. Um, one of the other items that's um, really added in this is we took some of the uses that are in the general business district that probably aren't appropriate for this intersection, which is a, a prominent intersection here in the town. Uh, the list, the, the uses that, are, that have been restricted are, are listed there. Automotive uses that really aren't appropriate, pawn shops, uh, things of that nature have been prohibited in this that may have either been allowed or allowed with an SUP and now they've just been prohibited. One use that has been added to this by right that is not currently allowed in the general business zoning is a restaurant use. And the reason we thought about a restaurant use in this case is the the SUP in this case would basically bring a site plan back for you to review and if they're coming back with a development plan and elevations it's the same as if they came back with that SUP. So in this case instead of making them go through the zoning process again to bring you the same site plan they were going to bring you with this case. The, a, in this proposed PD a restaurant use is allowed by right. However, um, I put in some other provisions in there to require to make the restaurant more of a, of, of a McClendon Chisholm restaurant, and that's if there's such a thing. Require some outdoor seating, um, have some minimum and maximum sizes for restaurants so that you get something that is probably more of a, less likely to be a fast food restaurant. It's limited on its size. It couldn't be a McDonald's, not that I think McDonald's would go there, just because of the size. Uh, the, the other, the real big issue that they've asked for besides those things is those changes to the commercial development standards. The commercial development standards today uh, allow a, require a minimum of a building of 2,500 square feet for the first floor, single floor. Um, and a maximum floor area of any given building on the site, you could have multiples of those, of 6,000 square feet. And then the length of any uh, wall of that building, be it 2,500 or 6,000, is 80 linear feet. So this provision uh, eliminates the 80 feet of a wall. Um, it leaves the minimum 2,500 square foot, so you won't get small little kiosk type buildings. Um, it does eliminate that 6,000 square foot maximum of any single story building. Um, in its place, um, I added, uh, they requested those, I added that any given tenant in a, in a building can't be more than 5,000 square feet. So you wouldn't get a large tenant if they built more than 6,000 square feet. Um, I told PNC to think of 5,000 square feet, what's 5,000? A Walgreens, CVS, they're all the same, they're on every corner, right, is about 5,000 square feet. So that would give you about, that's the size of that sort of building. Um, otherwise, the height regulations would remain the same. Uh, as mentioned, um, there's a conceptual plan. That's not the conceptual plan, don't look at that. He's got a development plan, but he's calling that a conceptual plan. What you have before you is a conceptual plan. It's in the document material. It sets, um, um, setbacks, in this case 25 feet versus 20 feet, uh, which is in there today for a general business. Gives you a little more chance to put some landscaping in there. Um, it's restricted on how much parking you can have between the front yard, between the building and the, and the facade. Uh, 
Um, it, re it still requires the building standards that are in the ordinance minus, we've had this discussion before, minus the state law changes on the building materials. It still requires that type of architecture with a base, a middle, and a, and a top to it. Um, it just doesn't specify what those materials are. Um, and we're talking zoning today, so I'll leave that as that. Um, otherwise, um, staff recommend approval of it. It does comply with the comprehensive plan, which calls for, for general business in this area. This is somewhat uh, restrictive on some uses, uh, allows a little more flexibility in the, in the development of it. Uh, P and Z uh, recommended denial. I believe the vote was three to one, as I recall. So I'm here to answer any questions you might have. Well, the chairman's here. He may be able to answer that better than I can, but I'll, 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 if you want to ask him, that's fine. Yeah. Sure. Did you want to hear the applicant first, so everyone would have? Would you like to hear the applicant first, so you, he, everyone can have benefit of okay. what he'd like to present? Just a second, no, I and then maybe right. the PNZ chair, and then just a suggestion. Hello again. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we purchased this lot a couple of months ago uh, for retail and commercial uh, developments here at the corner of the 550 and 205. And we are here today for the zoning change for the restaurant and outsetting uh, area for the restaurants. And like Carl mentioned, this is a uh, two building concept. We just providing one for the restaurant, the other one for the retail and mixed use. And no other tenant gonna be uh, uh, larger than 5,000 square foot. Any questions here? All right, thank you. Good evening, I'm Bev Stevens. I live at 279 Partridge Drive. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight, even though you took away half of my comments. But that's okay. I guess my biggest question to you is, why would you agree to this zoning change before you have an economic development plan in place? You have a committee, you've had a committee for quite a while that has been working on this. This zoning change is gonna live with this property until you change it again, which is costs in staff time, in legal fees, in your time, which you can't put a dollar on. You guys are invaluable. so. I am against the zoning change, and I hope you will listen to what I say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and uh, members of City Council. Uh, my name is Robert Rohde, and I serve as the chairman of the McClendon Chisholm Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, I have been asked to provide some background uh, information as to the majority decision to deny the request for a zoning change from general business, uh, which contained fixed definitions uh, for applicant and city to a planned development district for general business, uh, that allows and affords some flexibility for applicant and city at our January 16th, 2020 meeting. Uh, this process was a two-part agenda item consisting of a public hearing and a discussion and action segment. Uh, we heard from a citizen from uh, Chisholm Crossing Section 4 who was concerned about the proposed development as it would impact Cattle Baron Street and their community. Uh, also, uh, a lot of information we felt was superfluous to the planned development uh, land use change request. 
We saw a conceptual plan which is totally different from what was up on the screen. Uh, we did not have, we did not see any of these uh, drawings or, or, or uh, any of that at, at our meeting as well. And we felt that the plans were somewhat ambiguous in how it related to the change request and that the information eventually led to probably a premature discussion uh, centered on future construction, uh, some possible tenants, deed restrictions, uh, sewer uh, options, and we also heard some input from the applicant architect, engineer, as well as our staff. Uh, one of our commissioners even viewed current other projects by the applicant and deemed that these would not work in our community. Uh, we heard assumptions, and most of the commission was not comfortable relying on assumptions and hearing phrases such as our intention or that's up for debate. Uh, I admit that the commission uh, perhaps veered somewhat off course and let this impact the decision on the issue of land use change. Uh, I also believe these led to a decision reached. Uh, it created a doubt and some information was not definitive enough. Uh, it lacked structure, so rather than proceed and recommend to City Council for approval, the Commission chose the side of caution, knowing that the applicant could resubmit the request with information directly related to that land use change, or that it would come before Council and a clearer discussion that ensures the validity of that land use change request would occur. So that is kind of the background of our decision. And it was mentioned by, by the planner that uh, there was a three to one vote, and that is true. Uh, there were five of us at the meeting. Uh, I delayed my vote in case I had to break the tie. I didn't want to influence anyone. Uh, and then uh, when the vote was uh, three to one uh, to deny the request, I, I gaveled it done, and, and my vote wouldn't have mattered either way. But th that's why there was a three to one and there were five commissioners there. Any questions from council? Did you guys let them know what your concerns were at the time where they could come back and, and clear up? During the discussion and during the, the open meeting and the presentation, uh, the commissioners raised those questions and concerns. And that's when we had, we got the comments uh, from applicant and staff that it's our intention and, it, and it's also up for debate. And those were some things that we had some difficulty with, um, not knowing what those intentions were. And like I said, the, the, the plat that we received, or the conceptual plan that we received, was totally different than what you're looking at there, as well as any of the other artwork was, was not included in their presentation. But it, it seemed to, seems to me, though, that going from the uh, general business to the um, plan development, the big change is the, the restaurant, putting in the, the restaurant. And so was that not uh, described to you? No. I guess it's afternoon, mid-afternoon, three, four-ish, when, when, when Lisa was kind enough to uh, uh, send me an email uh, with this uh, information in it. So that was the first time that I have, or the commission has saw, has saw that uh, particular stuff. Yes, and and Council, you just might want to know, um, 
These are preliminary drawings up here, and I'm not sure if the architects wanted to come up and, and maybe describe the slides, um, but these four drawings were provided today, and they are preliminary, so um, they would still have to bring these back at a later date, but um, I think they wanted after P and Z to provide you at least some additional information about where they were headed as far as design. Okay. Thank you, All right. Thank you, sir. Yes, um, we had just finished these drawings, what you see here, uh, yesterday. And, um, and as an architect, when the, when the owner tells me, hey, Dave, what can you do at this site? Well, certainly I'm going to have to calculate how much built ratio of building area to parking lots can we do, how can we maximize, and, and, and this is what we came up with. Uh, subject to... To, uh, and I think the last time we were here, uh, there was confusion as to what's it going to look like. You know, I'm concerned, you know, uh, we just don't want a, a typical strip center on here. So, you know, we, we kind of went back to, uh, concentrating in the old town look and, and making the building facade with different smaller facades on it. Um, and, and of course, no, this wasn't done last week or the week before, you know, and, uh, but we as our team, inside team, we need to find out is this is viable for us as far as construction costs, site costs, it, it, does it work? You know, how much building can we get on there? How much, uh, parking can we get on there? We don't know until we do these drawings, until we, 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 we figure out what these drawings are, are. And, and of course we didn't know two weeks ago as far as you know what are the uh, details of this and we're not there yet I mean this is very conceptual and this is an image of you know what the owner wants to do with this building okay and um, it's very preliminary okay uh, and and things might change according to building regulations codes engineering, civil engineering, uh, structural, and things are going to change, landscape. So, um, and there's where we are right now. By no means this is a, <laughs> a conceptual, I mean, it is a conceptual plan, but it's not, it's just for us to understand what the building might look like, what we're uh, imaging to, and, you know, heights, uh, parking counts, uh, access to the building, to the, to the site, and that's basically what we're showing here. In a better, I guess, understanding as far as, uh, if we see the site plan, uh, the color site plan, you could, you know, see how much landscape there is beyond, uh, the property lines. And, um, and certainly what we're trying to do is just maximize the site, you know, maximize the building and parking to the site. And that's basically it. And then what's going to change? I mean, believe me, it's going to change from here. Once we get to the nuts and bolts, you know, with uh, building permitting, like I said, building permitting, our civil engineers, um, working with the city, it's, it's going to change. But our image, our character of the building is what we basically see here. And that's all we want to show is the character of the building and the way this, the, the uh, parking lot is going to work and what we can do with the buildings. Any questions? Thank you. Yes, once again, Mike Donigan, 2620 Ridge Lake Lane. I, I, I appreciate the, the developers working hard to, to come up with a concept that uh, that the city can uh, would like and embrace. I, my recommendation is the count. We have a capable planning zoning commissioner and 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 hopefully you know a dedicated and committed planning and zoning commission. I think it's it's behooves the city to allow the developer to work with planning and zoning before. I know we're talking about a zoning change. But when you get to this level, I think there's a layer, and there's a reason why we've got a layer there, 
that it's got to go through P and Z before it ever gets to council. Uh, and, and, and I really recommend that. And I also would, would suggest to our planner and our city staff, and I appreciate all the work, and I know we, we, we need to embrace good commercial and retail development, but once again, I reiterate, we can, we, we, let's plan, let's discuss, let's think it through, let's weigh our options. If we do this, what happens? It's a lot of work. Can't change that, but, but it can be re very rewarding and fruitful work. I also ask you all to consider uh, moratoriums on commercial and retail development uh, or an overlay district until we're able to provide more guidance to investors that come into our community. Uh, thank you. Although these rendering drawings were not in, in the P&Z packet, um, the staff report did show a restaurant and gave the square footage, the maximum square footage. So the details were in there, uh, but you would have to read through that staff report. Uh, there just weren't pictures. No, I'm just going off of what the commissioner is saying. Is it something we have to do tonight, or can they go back to P&Z with what they have now? I mean, or what we have now? And, and go back and, I mean, I'm just asking. I think maybe we want to ask the planner and or uh, our city attorney what that process would be. I've never actually seen that happen, so I don't know if they would need to start over with a new application uh, or if we can kick it back. My, my concern is it changes the request too much. When you started, they started the application with X request. If you change it too much, I also have to stress this very, very, because i got to mm -hmm. watch out for me. My job is to look at it. If some, a situation could go bad one time out of a thousand, 
I have to look at that because if I don't mention that, 999 times everything is going to be fine, but the one time it goes bad, you already look at me and go, why didn't you tell us that? So my concern here is that several things. You've got uh, some expressed opposition to it from the public. That's number one. Number two, you have a situation where if you, from the beginning, they fill an application, made a request for X. If council wants to say, hey, look, um, we're okay with some of it, but you probably need to change it to do this, this, or that, or whatever, but it changes it to Y, so you basically transmogrify that request. My concern there is it's not the same request, and it does have to go back to B. Now, that's looking at your worst case scenario, but I feel like that's what I have to look at. It. My, my feeling is if you change it to, but I don't mean necessarily change it, well, this one really should be 25 instead of 20. Okay, but if you're like, look, this use, let's add this other use, do this. Now you're getting into a situation where I think it may have changed the, the original request too much to make it a different request, which means notice wasn't made of that request, public hearing wasn't noticed for that particular request, and it should be treated as a whole new request. Also, the last thing from a technical standpoint, I don't know if our ordinances uh, permit us, once it gets to council, to send it back to, to PNC with recommendation. Typically, generally, normally that's covered in the city's uh, zoning ordinance. How they do that? I, I can see it starting over for to be clean, um, but I don't think the request has actually changed. I think they provided some additional information that would be helpful, um, and I think maybe we could express to PNC and you know emphasize more the land use and uh, if it went back that. The request hasn't really changed. All the things that were in the PNC staff report are the same things that are in this staff report. Um, yeah, um, I think you can remand it back to the planning commission uh, if you want to add things, like the attorney said. You need to re-advertise it. I think you would need to re-advertise it anyway to show that it's going to be another public hearing at PNC, uh, which would be in this case there's six property owners. Um, it's more of the newspaper notice than anything else. Uh, you can give some suggestions of what that might not be considered. Um, in this case, uh, when they made the application, they were at this stage. So I suggested that they not go to that stage if they weren't there yet to come up with a conception. But now they're, maybe the elevation's changed, but they're at a much more detail. They were at 20,000 feet, now they're at about two or 3,000 feet. Um, so that's something you're right. PNZ didn't have that because they weren't ready at application time and probably weren't that far along even two weeks ago. Uh, so I think you, I, and, and Lisa and I talked about this today, that maybe you remand it back to them and see if there's more information that can be provided. I think it, it is re-noticed that it's the same. It's the same as the same zoning case. It's, it's, it's all over again when you started with 90% of the same information. You may change it. Yeah, if y'all aren't trying to change anything and make recommendations, well, look, we would consider it more if you like this better, you did that. Here's the concern. This is not, this is very much out of the ordinary, okay, for at least for general all cities. So the concern, very technically speaking, 211-006 and 211-007 cover the process for zoning. Public hearings notice 10 days prior to P&Z hearings. Public hearing number two notice 15 days prior to city council hearings. It's one hearing for P&Z, one hearing for council. If it's the same one, technically, very, very strict reading of the statute, you don't need another public hearing for P&Z. You don't need another. Again, that's what makes these things so tricky when you want to remand. An abundance of caution would recommend the notice because you, you have a situation where someone wants they complain, hey, we didn't know about this, we didn't know about that, you didn't notice it. Just to avoid that hassle again, that's more you know time, money, and expense for the city to do that. So, but again, y'all are elected to not do what other people think you should do or what we think you should do. Carl can't tell you what to do. I can't tell you what to do. Lisa can't tell you what to do. You're elected to do what you think is best for the people. So if you think if you think what's best for the people is to have PNZ hear this with some of the things they didn't have before, I totally understand. To help effectuate that, and I think I hear Carl with me, we recommend 
even though technically you may not have to do it, you will never go wrong giving, quote unquote, too much notice. So I would encourage notice, just like you did before for the PNZ, and notice just like you did uh, for the council meeting. So I would, if you if you make a motion to remand it back to them, I would say and include the re-notice provisions. Now, let me remind council what's your discussion and action on this just as long as but I don't think planning and zoning have the information we are getting now. And that's why they are denying it because they didn't have all of the information. I understand. And I rely on them. Okay. I understand. That. So I'm, I'm not trying to say yes or no. I'm just trying to say. I'm just reminding you, it's just for as long as That will no longer be an option. Just, just I just want everybody to be aware of. Well, I, want, I mean, with the with the inclusion to provide updated information to P and Z. Okay. Then what what I would advise you to do is make a motion to remand it to P and Z. Yeah, uh -oh. That's what okay. I, was, I was. Right. So I want to make it really clear. I was wondering. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm sorry. And I got it because rules of no, 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 procedure no, it's adopted by, by statute now. Since we've got a motion and a second on the floor, technically we have to go through the motion. If you don't want to no, deny it, then we just nobody votes for anything. But we technically have to go through the motion since we've got a motion and a second on the floor. So I'll make a motion. I'll revise my motion. Well, first we have to go through the motion and second. Uh, Started on working on this, you didn't get it to us in time yes. for them. And so now I'm just wondering is there anything else out there before they go, you guys go back to them?
As requested, you kind of wanted an update. The way we, the way we mess them up with batteries when we turn them off. They eat up batteries. All right, go ahead, Chief. Senator. All right. Um, as you requested, you want to kind of update or kind of see where we have been and, and where we're going. So I put together here a, a small list of, of some of the things that we accomplished over the last year. Um, and it's kind of, to me, it's some significant things that we as a department were able to accomplish. So as you see there at the top, um, as we go through this packet, there are some documents or a few documents that will kind of support some of the things we're talking about. But you can see the first thing there at the top, we obviously were able to establish and become a, a, um, a TCFP compliant department. We, we call it a combination department. We're not a career department, but we're a combination department, and that's based on our, our staffing. We don't, you know, we don't have just all full-time staff. We do have a mixture, which we'll get into, uh, or you can see down there, uh, increased staffing. We, we started out with 12 when the integration uh, kind of began, and we've grown it to 23, and that 23 includes your full-time staff, part-time staff, and volunteers. Out of that 23, you have six full-time or full-time equivalent. You have 14 part-time and then three volunteers. Out of those 23, we now have 20 that are TCFP, Texas Commission on Fire Protection certified, and or EMT or paramedic. Now, just for clarification for some of us that don't always understand, when you say they're that certified, so is that, that would be the same certification as any paid firefighter within any other paid fire department, such as Rockwall or Rowlett or- Dallas, Richardson, Garland, Irving, so Frisco. Correct. And so those certifications range from basic firefighter all the way up to master firefighter, um, from driver operator to hazmat technici technician to uh, fire arson investigator, fire inspector. So we have a, a wide spectrum of individuals that have uh, now have gone out and, and achieved their certifications. We have three volunteers who we classify as a volunteer, uh, non-certified, or they're currently enrolled in the State Firemen's and Fire Marshals Association training program. Uh, training program takes a long time, but they've have gotten to the point now where two of the three are actually in the process of challenging the Texas Commission on Fire Protection test. So we've put they've they've gone down a path. They've gone through the certification process with the State Firemen's and Fire Marshals Association to get their cert, their level one through five. Um, they've completed that, so now they have to take a a hazmat awareness and operations course through a um, fire academy and once they do that then they can actually challenge to sit and, and take the Texas Commission test so we currently have two members that are in the process of doing that so uh, once they complete that during this year uh, we'll only have one that currently is remaining as a volunteer without any type of certifications um, as you all know we accepted we had six safer grants that was a six full-time or full-time equivalent when we began the process, obviously everybody's very familiar with the integration of the two departments and, and the things that we had to accomplish. It was a lot of, uh, there were a lot of items throughout the year that we had to, you know, timelines we had to meet and, and, and I think we, we achieved 90% of those early. The one that we did wait a little bit on was the, the remaining cash balance from MCVFD, but we did that for a reason. The fact that we still were required to maintain their constitution and bylaws as a fire department plus operate under the city's rules and regulations, policies and procedures. So, and taxes being a nonprofit, lots of things that we had to wait on, but eventually we were able to bring that $54,000 over from MCVFD and was deposited into capital replacement funds or into the general funds, if I'm not mistaken. Um, we also began the process with text, with text dots. TxDOT came in, as everybody knows, is widening the station, so we began the process of the, and, and completed the assessment of Station 1. Um, we have had lots of conversations. We know that they're going to not take away the whole, all the property, but they will take away our duty hut, our tiny home fire station there that we're, we're proud of. So, Chief, we still haven't gotten an appraisal We've actually got a pro got some just recently some, received the packet, and we are in the process of reviewing it before we bring it to council. So um, that will be on our next next, next meeting, next agenda. So we did we just received that, um, and I've had some conversation with the the reps in regards to that property, and also um, as we move forward with 
getting TxDOT to go ahead and start maybe allowing us to begin our process for architects and things like that. So there's lots of movement. We're starting to move uh, a little bit smoother now. <clears throat> um, what you see the next one there, we received offer, so we're, we're reviewing that. Um, received our first TCFP or Texas Commission on Fire Protection uh, Compliance Inspection. If you see there in your next document, that's actually the official document that states that we went through our compliance inspection. We did have some minor violations. Any council member that would like to see that, I'd be more than happy to give it to you. But it was in regards to policies, some things from when we originated, originally started in our, our policies and procedures that were approved by the commission in 2018, um, in April there, or October, sorry. Um, when they were approved, we had some changes, NFPA standards changes and things like that. So our minor violations were along those lines there. And there's, um, minor is exactly what it is. It's just a minor violation, you know, some upgrades or some different changes needed. Um, so we, we achieved that and we come, got through that. We did implement a new annual physical agility test for our staff. So we all go through an annual PT test. In the beginning, we did not have that in there. You can see that in an example where this is one of the policies that we've actually implemented um, over the year. Um, through that policy on the second page here, you can see where we implemented and we revised it. And we have what we call a seven event program that all our staff will go through annually to make sure that we are all fit for duty. Um, it's, it's, it's not an easy test, a tough test, so it's forced me to make sure I you know, lose some weight. But anyway, so then the next policy you see there, 503, we actually implement a new hiring process. You know, we really didn't have a hiring process set. So now we have one that's in policy of states. This is the, pro the, the policy or the process that we will go through anytime we have a new applicant come in, whether they're full-time, part-time or volunteer. And if we run all those members through the same process, so as we go down the road and years down the road, if we have a opening, that comes up within the full-time staff, then if we were to bring somebody from the part-time staff, we've already been through the hiring process. It's a matter of, of, of paperwork and, and, and transition them over. But you can see there um, the policy that we implemented. We also, um, Captain Griffith, um, Assistant Chief Murphy, we all come together and, and changed up our training program. They used to have four meetings a month, one business meeting and three training, training meetings a month as a uh, volunteer fire department. And, and those are tough to meet. So we wanted, I want quality instead of quantity. And so we got together, had some discussions, and what you see in front of you is our new training schedule for 2020. You'll notice that we have training every month. It's gonna be different topics. We have online CE trainings. That's target solutions that you see there. But we also have these things called quick drills. So this month they have 10 of them. On the back there, you'll see what quick drills means or target solutions and quick drills. When we refer to quick drills, it's every month it's issued via email or PDF. Um, there's 10 of them. And it, two of them will be policy reviews. So whether it's city policy or department policy that we've implemented, it, the responsibility of all staff to go through and do these quick drills along with some type of EMS and then fire related. Training is big. We, we like to train and, and we're trying to implement our pro or improve our program that we have. The program we had was not bad. There was nothing wrong with it, but we tried to see come up with ways to make it even better than what we had, and this is our outcome. So they'll do not only C solutions or, or training solu uh, Cs online, but we also do hands-on. So we have one hands-on training meeting a month, and that's the first Tuesday of every month, is where everybody comes together, and we'll focus on whatever training topic may be for that month. Um, the next is a program, as you see, it says draft. Um, looking at it, at trying to come up with some other program to implement a community program, it's called the Safety Awareness for Everyone Safe. Um, hopefully everybody has a copy of there and I didn't miss anybody. But it's an opportunity to start trying to engage the community a little more and maybe have some little fun competitions if we put this program together and come up with all the different courses that we can offer is where we kind of have each community out there working hard or, or wanting to bring us in and have some, some training with them. And some of the programs that we would offer an outreach here is basic just station tours. People coming up wanting to see our tiny home, look at our big red sleds and, and play with the lights and sirens. Um, going and, and taking the fire truck by birthday parties. We've done uh, several of those over the summertime where they call up and we'll go by and spend 15, 20 minutes there, hand out stickers or, or these plastic helmets and, and let the kids look at the fire trucks. Um, home safety surveys, those are free. It doesn't cost the citizens anything. 
citizen has that feels like that they want us to come out um, and those that are inspectors to come out and do an actual uh, home safety survey, we'll be more than happy to, free of charge, no cost. Uh, neighborhood events, block parties, National Night Out's a big one. We wanted to get more of these communities involved with National Night Out, whether they do it on that night of or they have separate nights, which I've worked in cities where we'll have them for about a week long or two week period. And our goal is to make sure that we're out there and that we're participating in with the, those events. Speaking at HOA meetings and then stop the bleed courses, CPR. I mean, there's numerous courses, fire extinguisher training. This is just a draft and this is kind of a program of where we want to go in the future. So. Do you guys ever change out smoke alarm batteries for people? We do. Yes, ma'am, we do. So uh, they'll call us and we'll go out and, and make sure that whether it's batteries or if we have to, we've gone as far where we've gone and purchased um, some replacement smoke detectors from Home Depot, Lowe's, Walmart, wherever we can get them um, and, and replaced it for them. Because we want to make sure everybody has smoke detectors in all the required areas of their home. Um, so we talked about the training program, kind of got ahead of myself with safety there. We did implement some new softwares. PS Tracks is one of them. Um, our inventory was, was, we had an inventory. It's a lot of data entry in old Excel, so we were able to find a software now that will keep up with every bit of equipment that we have that you as council has, as the city has, that they own. Also it allows us to do our daily checks. We do daily checks on our PPE that we wear. We also do it on our SCB, SCBAs, your self-contained breathing apparatus, and our fire trucks. So this software will allow us to be able to document that and have great records now. Instead of good records, we'll have great records to where we can keep up with what's going on with the uh, expenditures. Target Solutions, I already mentioned that one. That's our training CEs. So it allows our guys to go on there. Target Solutions is a great company. They allow us to have fire, EMS, and law enforcement CEs uh, for one flat rate of package price. So everybody on the department has access to Target Solutions. So we do lots of training. Goals for 2021, implement the new community outreach program safe, um, begin the design and hopefully build the new McLennan Chisholm Fire Station 1. That'll be a fun project. Um, goal is to have 100% TCFP or EMT paramedic staff um, as we move forward. Anybody that comes on or was to come on, if we have any more part-time positions, they are required to be uh, Texas Commission on Fire Protection certified EMT or paramedic. And then a new volunteer program. We haven't had, you know, we've put it out there and we've tried to get out, draw people in and there hasn't been a big um, draw or I, we haven't had people knocking down the doors to become a volunteer. And so some of the things I ask the staff is what should we do? What can we do to kind of hopefully maybe implement a new program? And one of them is, is looking at how we can have a volunteer program that may not, we, nobody in the community is knocking on the door to say I want to volunteer. So why not offer it up? Because we've had some contacts from people from Roy City, from Rockwall, or may live in Garland, may live in Forney that are young men and women. Several of them I've had recently just got it fresh out of the military. And I will, come on. Um, what can we do type thing, put a program together. So it may be that we put a program together where they're not really a benefit to us when a call comes in because of where they live, but we can require them to spend so many hours at the fire station every month to be a participating member, which is an additional body on shift for when we have those calls. So those are some of the things that we're looking at for 2021. If you have any questions on any of that above, any I'm here. Of our great they cost me money um, the uh, I'm actually looking at some other options that will in the future as we move along here um, when it comes to maintenance now I'm starting to put together some maintenance costs when it comes to these different apparatus and and and, and I plan on bringing up for council if it becomes a, 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 a continual problem mm -hmm. and looking at what other options we may have um, but there were everything's in service everything is operational um, but we've had to, we, we've spent some money on some vehicle maintenance outside of our normal annual pms okay. is there a way to project with the next you know when we start talking budget talks here in a few months is there a way for you to look in your crystal ball and see give us a rough idea of what those ongoing costs may be I I can give you the cost of what our what we know our annual PMs when it comes to the the basic fluid changes and then our pump testing and hose testing and ladder testing of those apparatus. When it comes to you know alternators going bad or high pressure fuel or oil pumps going out on a truck, 
I can go back and look at what we've spent, but I can't predict is that going to happen again or not. But I, I can give you an idea of what we've spent over the last year, and, and that's something I'll definitely bring before council as we start preparing for budget talks here in the next month or two. Absolutely. All right. Now we're going to move to 6.7. Discussion and action regarding authorizing the fire chief to accept the cost share grant in the amount of $20,000 from the Texas A&M Forest Service for fire rescue equipment. Copies. Chief Simmons? Yes. So, as we, yes, I just got a great copy. So, we recently found out, <laughs> you'll see on there the date says November 25th, 2019. In this transition period, working with the Forestry Service and other entities out there that we deal with, somehow, some way, emails got crossed. They were using an old email we don't use anymore. Luckily, somebody from the Forestry Service said, let me take one more step, reach out. Um, we happened to be at the fire station the other day, and the phone rang, and it was this, it was an individual that says they're from the Forestry Service. We're, we, we offered you a grant. We haven't received your acceptance letter. We didn't know where it was, so they resent it to us and gave us some time. So that's why I bring this before you today. It was last week when we received it. This grant is up to 75% of payout. So up to $20,000 is what, what Texas Forestry Service is offering us. Right now I have staff looking at what can we, what, what, was our, what, what are our biggest needs. And right now to kind of help us move forward and, and, and have a better plan when it comes to the cancer initiative, having two sets of gear and, and making sure we have uh, replacement gear and service so when we do have those exposures um, one of the things that we're looking at is possibly purchasing uh, seven sets of new gear uh, right now just for the full-time staff that would give them their two sets um, and this money would go towards the purchase of that new gear and they would pay up to twenty thousand dollars so i'm asking council for approval to to accept that uh, we will put in a request to uh, texas forestry service if we decide to go with the PP the bunker gear, uh, we will put a request to them uh, for them to say, yeah, that's approved on this this particular grant. Motion. So make a motion to authorize the, uh, the chief to <coughs> accept a cost share grant in the amount of twenty thousand dollars from the Texas A and M Forest Service for fire and rescue. All right, do I have a second? Second. Got a motion and a second. Is there any discussion on it? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Show that unanimous. Thank you. All right. 6.8 discussion of fireworks and their use within the city limits. Thanks, Mayor. Um, obviously, this has been a hot topic for years and years. And, um, you know, I uh, just I wanted to see what the and the reason I bring it up is I had a couple of citizens raise some concerns about shooting fireworks and when they were being shot and, you know, is this something that we as a council want to start to look at addressing in some way? You know, again, I am pro fireworks, rah, rah, USA, that sort of thing, but I don't want to <laughs> burn down somebody's house because of carelessness either. Mr. Rogers, and just this is something is, yeah, yeah, and this is something that I do have um, that's been the top of our list right now. We have went through and reworked the, started working, reworking the ordinances and codes, adopting new codes. So okay. one of the things is we're going to come before council here in the near future is, is advancing or adopting the 2015 fire code and all the other codes associated with it and one of the topics that i have two big topics fireworks and uh sprinkler systems when it comes to commercial building size and all that that we don't currently have in play so this is something that we will bring before council and it's something that council can start thinking about you know i'm not against fireworks i'm not afraid of fireworks at all i enjoy fireworks but when it comes to a subdivision and i'll use sonoma verde as a prime example as close as those lots are I think it's crazy that somebody can go in their backyard there and shoot a six inch or eight inch artillery shell out of their backyard. It just, it's just not safe. So those are some of the things that council may want to start looking at is how could we come up with something that would still allow people that live out here on these big wide open spaces to be able to do that, 
but do it in a controlled manner when it comes to these subdivisions. So will you, Chief, will you come to the council with a list of recommendations on or proposals of what we could implement? Absolutely. And if you have any recommendations as council um, that you think that you would like for me to look at for options, by all means, you know, please send them to me. But that would be the, the goal is to bring you some options to look at. What right. would you like those back? Anytime. I know we're looking in the next couple of months to hopefully come before council when it comes to adopting the, the codes fourth of july then. we you know yeah. we had an issue Police. last year with Police. um fireworks um, uh, one displayed and it was a it was a professional display and it tells you how even professional displays can go south very quickly um, we were able to control it regroup and have them reset but we it still caused some problems it caused some friction um, with with a lot of people that lived in that area um, and so it's it's a concern you know I, we're going to have them relocate that show I don't think it needs to be where it is anymore it's not safe um, but those are the things that we look at in the future and it was a professional show again and there are there are other cities with ordinances based on how their housing is set up mm -hmm. in their cities to regulate right. that for the obvious reasons, I mean, you were very gracious in the way you said it, but nobody wants to go, nobody wants to burn down the city for a few fireworks. Right. Uh, so, my apologies, yes. that was just one to give you the heads up that we, no, we have discussed that and, and continue to work on it. One step ahead of me. Great. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. All right, we're done with 6.8. We're going to move to 7.1, recess into executive session. In accordance with Texas Government Code 551.071, brackets number two, consultation with the city attorney on a matter of the duty of the attorney to the government body under the Texas Disciplinary Rules of Professional Conduct and State Law of Texas clearly conflicts, conflicts with this chapter regarding consideration of entering into a development agreement with Mohammed Palami representing MFS Group LLC related to property generally located south of intersection 550 and state highway 205 it is 8 10 we are to recess the session Yes, yes, absolutely. Am I done? You need me? If not, I'm going to my grandkid. If you, but I'll stay. I'll hang out. You need somebody to hang out here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.
Good, sir. How are you? Good, sir. How are you doing? James Cornell. Jim, sir. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So, I see uh, you're in Marston investigating too. Yes, well, I was in law enforcement before I came here. So, I was, uh, so I'm all the above. I'm one month, I guess you want to call it. So, the uh, city holds your commission. Yes, so we have the fire marshal's office. So, we actually we established that in the beginning. So, yeah, I can carry my commission here. I'm a police officer in Dallas. Oh, nice. 29 years. Are you retiring yet? Yeah. I was in city council for years. Oh, very nice. Um, it's, and I wanted to hear your report tonight. That's part of the reason I was here today. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Um, Got any questions? Um, kind of. So, are you, are you the code enforcement officer also? Just read. Well, the council has just. Over the past few months, have decided to to slide code enforcement under the fire department. Okay. So uh, a week ago, I went uh, back then. I said, "Oh, let me find a class so I can get in." So a week ago, I went in, went to the class. I didn't need to because being a peace officer, you don't have to. You don't have to go to code. But I mean, I'm not a code guy. I never plan on being a code guy, but I want to have a better understanding. So I went to Mesquite and attended the class. So recently, just got certified um, as a code compliance officer. Okay. Um, so I will be the one that starts that process and, and I you know I'm gonna I'm gonna try to make sure I'm out there you know and when I have downtime I, I drive a city vehicle get out there and look but you know right now I'm on, on a reactive not proactive right. so and I get it I mean because obviously one of my biggest things being on the council here ever since then I'm still waiting for the police officer mm -hmm. yeah, you're a police officer that's you're okay. forward. correct Absolutely. No, and I, I've tried to explain it to council when we established the fire marshal's office. You know, they, they saw this. When you're, you're a master peace officer, you're a cop, you've been on this. Yeah, I've got left 15 feet. That's not working. I've worked my way up now. I'm used to play fire into my career type thing. But um, I can't go out and force any and all of the orders. If I wanted to go out here in my vehicle and make a traffic stop, I can make that kind of mistake. Well, yeah, you know what I tell people, you know, because I was always in the DPS concept, so I was in he. You know, I started Rockwell many years ago, and then I was in he, and then fake DPS, so I worked my way up the ranks there. So I've made those traffic stops, and we've made that, you know, burglary call in a fire truck with three men on because it was just the way we operated. You know, and people would say you called for somebody in this house, and here comes a fire truck, and guys jump off it. It was always fun to see, you know. Yeah, Here's, here comes the cross dressers, is what I used to say. But anyway, um, yeah, getting them to explain it. You know, I can't enforce it. You have a, a law enforcement officer in this community. Right, you uh, kind of leading towards what I would love to see is some of the other firefighters kind of commission these officers to kind of create a DPS. Uh, you say that now, once it's, it's funny to say that. I have three. I, I wish, and, and it's something I'm going to address here in the very, very, very near future. Maybe even by this next budget. Yes, sir. Hi, House. Let's get together for another cold beer. Yeah. Come on. Keep me updated. I, I don't. I am so. But I'll keep you updated on the. Uh, precinct thing. Yeah, we got to okay. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I really want to get back. Yeah, you're going to be precinct too. Yeah, I'm going yeah. to. I want to make that. Okay. All right. See you. Good. 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 Thank Good you. See, sir. Um, We've, we've really been talking. I, I contacted um, a couple schools. I know Marshall House, you you're over in Mesquite. I went there in 90, um, was when I went through. But because um, we had some that were doing the, what they call the fire department schedule. And, and Greenville, or Hunt County was doing it. So I contacted, I just went blank. Anyway, they're not doing the fire department schedule right now. But I have three. Like, I got this. They want to do this. They want to go get it because they want to know, they, they know the future of this place. And I'm a big believer in the component of this is the DPS concept. And I believe you get the most bang for your buck as a small community. Um, so I've done, I spent all my career, most of my, 90% of my career in the DPS concept. So um, it will work, but I have some that are wanting to go through. It's expensive, it's going to cost them about 2300 bucks to go out here. I said I will do my part to help them um, maybe get the equipment they need, you know, the Sam Browns and all the, you know, the ammo and things like that. So, um, and if I don't, if we're not able to do it this go-round, then, you know, one of the things I want to talk about.
talk to counsel about it in the future, but his next budget is that. Why not? Because we know that's coming one day that they're going to say, See, sir, or it's going to be yours. Correct. The same thing we did over there for years of fate. Now fate has their own. But that's why they went because it got to the point where it was going to cost them so much money they went right. Come out. And it is expensive to do, even back then it's expensive because they, you're paying to cover all the costs, the comp insurance, everything. That That's what you saw. Yes, sir. And I totally understand that. Right. You're reimbursing back to the county for this right. officer to work eight hours or between the 16 and the 24. Right. Whatever you can afford it. You can afford it. But the idea, if you've got some of your firefighters that want to go to the because we do that. I work with this department. Mm -hmm. so I'm a fire instructor. I've been out there for 10 years, but I did the patrol for 19 years in the Northeast Division. And we have DFD, well, three or four guys in DFD in our. Yeah, yeah. I've you know, known for years that yeah. once they get their critical license, they're out there. Down. Yeah, they're, 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 they're on their own. Dallas is going to carry them, but. Yeah, they, yeah. they carry them over there. Like that. And see, well, that's the thing. I told you guys, we can carry them here. Uh, I carry them in my marshal. I hear my, my problem, and then I've talked to, and I, I'm going to talk to her again. She called her. Uh, over in Canada, uh, because I want these guys to go through it. I want them to get trained. I can't train them all. Yeah, I'm a training officer, but I can't train them all myself. So I want to work it, whether it's Heath, Faith, Forest City, somebody would be willing to work with us for these guys. You know, if it happens or if it comes up, whoever goes wrong. Now we've got guys that aren't just certified at Tico, but they actually have experience. So if that time comes, right. It's a slow process, but it's something that I've tried to work on for 20 years. I think it's coming. I just need. It's just the time. The number one thing you see is that, and it's usually a new role in the building. You want to have a lot of it.
so many ways to set it up. You can get it back with the county. Absolutely. And you've got, so there's so many ways to set up the AC to where you can do it and keep the cost down as much as possible. So if you're going to have an initial upfront cost, there's no way around it. You're going to have to. You've got to get the equipment. But once you do that, it's easy. It's going to be easy to maintain it for a while. And then you make adjustments as it's moving through. So, I've thought about it for a long time, and I told the council that hired me when they talked about his apartment. It's like, you really should focus over here. You know? Well, they want to get a lot of other stuff. Yeah, I see it. But anyway. All right. Hey, well, hey, pleasure to meet you. Man. And anytime you come by and see me. Um, but uh, yeah, I would, those are some things, you know, I'd love to start talking to some group of citizens as we move along to see what their thoughts are. Uh, because I know it will happen. Yeah. No doubt. Got it. It's, it's going to. This town's good. Rock was the fastest growing market. One of the fastest growing in the state. It's the richest, it's the richest per capita of the state of Texas. It's the smallest county in Texas. Yes, sir. And, you know, it just means my whole deal is when we jump into the taxes, you're going to be a city. Be a city. Be a city. Let's, we're not playing city anymore. We're going to be one now. So now that we are, let's be one. And that's why we people moving in. It's kind of services too. Absolutely. They really do. They do. I agree. They're moving. There's a regular people in California and they, and they can't believe they don't have this and that. Yeah, so there's some police departments. Yeah, so they're here all the time. You'll see it, but they're not dedicated. They're county. You call them, you know, it's fine. They're county, basically. And then you have a fire department. You're in your fire department. What else search do we have? That's it. We got trash there as you do it with the director. It doesn't come to the city, and your water's by this company, this company, or this company. Oh no, I know. <laughs> hey, it's a pleasure. Right. Thanks. Yeah, very nice. Thank you. Have a good one.
ladies on how to properly dispose of the flag. So thank you very much. And as, as you said, Mayor, it went off really well. Uh, the other thing I'd like to talk about is our Lunch and Learn is yes. on Tuesday. And our DA, Ken Nicole Pepper, is going to be here to speak with us for about an hour. So please let your friends know. I think it's going to be a really informative session. She'll talk about the uh, crime statistics here in Rockwall County. and even go into uh, things that we don't even know go on here. So I've heard her speak at other venues, and it's always very informative. So it's on Tuesday, February 4th from 12 to 1 right here at City Hall. Thank you. If you've never heard Kim speak before, some of the things she talks about when it comes to our county are, are eye-openers. Mm -hmm. so, she, she, uh, Mr. Hawkins? Uh, no report, sir. Ms. Judy? Uh, I don't have anything. Okay. Um, Mr. Blaine's not here, so he doesn't have anything. Um, Rose Consolium, did you have anything from the last meeting? Uh, no, we didn't have, I don't think we had anything to update. I don't think there's any changes that are going to affect us at this time. All right. Mr. Dahl? No, sir. Nothing? Okay. Well, it is 8.42. We've gone through everything in the agenda tonight. So, meeting adjourned. Go home and enjoy your family.